You'll be turning in your Bibles to Acts chapter 14 while we're going to cover the whole chapter uh, very briefly this morning. Uh, I'm only going to read uh, three verses momentarily, <clears throat> verses 21 through 23. Uh, you also have this morning in your uh, bulletin a map of Paul's first missionary journey. And so while I don't want uh, you coloring it during uh, the sermon, uh, it is good to uh, make note of it as to uh, where, uh, where we are in the world so that you can kind of follow and understand on this first missionary uh, journey. As we do each week, let's stand in honor of God's Word. We believe and we teach that the Bible is the inspired Word of God, His only rule of faith and practice. May it be a light and a lamp to us all. Hear the Word of the Lord, starting in Acts 14, verse 21. They, that is, Paul and Barnabas, preached the good news in that city, and won a large number of disciples. And then they returned to Lystra, and Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for, e uh, for them in each church and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. Father, we ask now that you would bless not only the reading, but the hearing of your word. But we pray that we would see no man save the Lord Jesus Christ only, for it's in his name we ask it. Amen. Be seated. Chapter 13 and then all of chapter 14 is Paul's first missionary journey. It's rather short in compared, comparison to some of his others. And as he goes through the various cities preaching the gospel, uh, if you would take the time at some point to read the whole chapter, you would see that he retraces his steps. Uh, but he's spending some time here in the 14th chapter in several cities in Galatia. That is an area that I believe we would now refer to as Turkey. Now, I want to briefly tell you what has happened in the parts of chapter 14 before we read because we're going to spend the majority of our time this morning looking at the hardships of entering the kingdom of God. They are first in this chapter, after they have left uh, Cyprus, in Iconium. Iconium. And there they start, as usual, in the synagogue. Uh, it is the practice, was the practice of Jesus. Uh, we saw, in, for instance, when he goes into the synagogue in Nazareth. It is Paul's practice to always try to begin in the synagogue. A synagogue was not a temple. It was a Jewish community center. And every city that had a uh, fairly small number of Jewish men, I think it was maybe 14 or 12, uh, they had to have a synagogue in that city. And so Paul would always go there, and each Sabbath uh, the Jews would gather there, and someone would take the scroll out and read part of the scroll, and then you had the opportunity, if you wanted to say something that week in regard to that scripture or anything else you could. And so um, there Paul and Barnabas go to the synagogue, and a lot of uh, Jews and Gentiles believe from their preaching. Now, I would venture to say 
that if we follow the pattern of Paul, and indeed follow the pattern of Peter before Paul, when they're speaking or preaching to Jews and God-fearing Greeks or Gentiles, they always begin with Old Testament passages and trace how Christ was promised throughout the Old Testament leading up to uh, what we would call the New Testament, which of course has not been even written at this point. And I'm sure here as well, Paul is doing that too. But our passage would tell us that some people refused to believe. That is, not that they just didn't care, but that they made a, a personal commitment to turn their back on the preaching of Paul and Barnabas. And it says here that Paul and Barnabas spent a long time there uh, preaching the grace of God. And in fact, it tells us that God blessed their preaching so much that he confirmed to the people of Iconium that these men were his servants by the doing and carrying out of miraculous signs and miracles done through Paul and Barnabas there. It says in verse 3 that Paul and Barnabas spent a considerable time there speaking boldly for the Lord, who confirmed the message of His grace by enabling them to do miraculous signs and wonders. But the city was divided. We had those who were angry, who had refused, and they stirred up a rebellion, as had happened in other places, as we know already, against Paul and Barnabas. The people of the city reacted differently, some believing, others refusing. So they stirred them up to stone Paul and Barnabas, and they found out about it and left the city to go to Lystra and Derby, or Derby, depending on where you are. Now, the next city that they come to is Lystra. This is the place where Luke details one of the miracles that God has done to confirm that Paul and Barnabas are indeed speaking <clears throat> for him. We see in verse 8, in Lystra there was a, sat a man crippled in his feet who was lame from birth, who had never walked. And he listened to Paul as he was speaking. And Paul looked directly at him and saw that he had faith to be healed. And he called out, stand up on your feet. And at that the man jumped up and began to walk. Reminiscent of even the miracles of Christ. But Lystra was a very heathen city. In fact, right outside of the city, there was a temple to Zeus. And so as the men did these miracles, really before they ever had a chance to begin to go into the synagogue and preach to the Jews for any length of time, They've done this miracle, and so the heathen in that city see this man who has been lame their entire life, and they believe, as is the folklore of that particular area we can trace back in history, they see them as the incarnation of the gods themselves. And so Barnabas is called Zeus, and Paul, the spokesman of the gods, Hermes. And in fact, we see that a priest brings an animal of some sort to offer a sacrifice to Paul and Barnabas, believing that they were the incarnation of these gods. Well, it's also true that in Lystra, they, they, while they understood Greek, they had a dialect that was mainly spoken within their own city. And uh, 
archaeology would tell us that they mostly used that language. And so it would have been a language that Paul and Barnabas would not have understood immediately that these people were calling them gods. And when they finally find out, it says in the Bible that they ripped their clothes and tore them apart. For they were so upset that these these people would see them not as the servants of the high God, but as incarnation of pagan man-made gods. And so in verse 14, Paul and Barnabas, after they've torn their clothes, shout. And look what they say in verse 15. It's so different from sermons that we've heard up to date. Men, why are you doing this? We too are only men, human like you. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. In the past, he let all nations go their own way, yet he has not left himself without testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven crops in their seasons. He provided you with plenty of food, fills your heart with joy. Notice when the audience shifts to an audience that is completely foreign to Jewish practices, he does not go to Old Testament text, which they would have no reference point for, but simply goes to creation itself. That there is an ultimate God who has created the heavens and the earth and all that there is. And this God has not left you unblessed by providing rain and crops. That he is the one true God, not these man-made worthless gods. You see, folks, here's the point that I would make very briefly here at this mark of our vignette. You have to be able to be adaptive in how you share the gospel. Some people will have a reference point that they know about Jesus. They've heard about Jesus or they've been exposed at some level to the Bible. But then you'll have other people, even in today's post-Christian culture, believe it or not, who will have never heard the name of Jesus Christ, who will know nothing about him. I was talking to somebody Wednesday night and they said, you know, Probably a third of the folks here know something about Jesus. And a third of the folks don't want anything to do with Jesus. And there are a third of the folks here who've never heard of Jesus. That's the reality in which we live. And so you need to learn how to be adaptive to the situation and to the audience to the person that you're talking to when you're talking about the gospel. Well, the troublemakers again show up here in Lystra. This group is kind of following Paul and Barnabas like a bad penny, a shadow cast over them from city to city, stirring up trouble. And here they actually stone Paul and drag him outside the city thinking that he was dead. But he was not. God had not finished with the work of Paul. I remember someone telling me one time, giving me the statement, every one of us is immortal until we have finished what God has planned for us to do. Each one of us is immortal until God has finished with all he has planned for us to do. Well, Paul is not dead. He revives and comes out of the city and they go to Derby. There they preach the good news as well. And we begin where we read this morning in verse 21 that they preached the good news in that city and won a large number of disciples. 
They had established churches in each of these cities as they went along. Now, we don't know exactly how long Paul spent in each city. Sometimes it tells us, but here we don't know. Sometimes it's a long time. Sometimes it's only a short time. But nonetheless, they have preached the word, people have believed, and churches have been established. So now, Paul and Barnabas retrace their steps back through each of these cities, encouraging the believers, strengthening them to remain in the faith, and appointing elders for each church. Now, I wanted to preach this morning on eldership, but I decided to hold that till we get to uh, chapter 20. And so I'll do that at this point at that point. But Paul, <clears throat> excuse me, Paul makes an arresting statement for each of us in verse 22. If you have your Bible still out, look at this verse with me. And this is where we want to finish up this morning. It says in verse 22 that they went back through these cities, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true in the faith. And then look at this sentence. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of heaven. That's his parting word, or part of his parting word, to each of these churches. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of heaven. If we had the time this morning, we would go over and look at Paul's hardships. They are listed for us in his writings. How many times he was beaten, how many times he was stoned. How he learned to be content in plenty and in want, in sickness and in health. But I want to talk for just a minute this morning about the hardships that you will endure if you are truly living out your Christian faith, hardships that you will endure to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, God willing, none of us will be stoned here in Louisville. But would we ever think that we would pray each week and list in the bulletin each week that Andrew Brunson has been held in prison for 266 days now. He is living out the hardship of entering into the kingdom of God. But what about you here? What about us here in Louisville and the surrounding county? What are hardships that we might endure to enter the kingdom of heaven? After all, we have it pretty easy here, don't we? We have food to eat, clothes to wear. Our sanctuary is nice and cool this morning. We had donuts and coffee before. Chocolate-covered donuts at that. I mean, what better life could we be living, right? But if you're living out your faith in Jesus Christ, you will have hardships, personal hardships. One of the most difficult, I think, that we come to face is the hardship within our own life as we turn our back on the sin that we love the idols that we have established in our lives, that's hard work, folks. Yes, we love Jesus when we come to accept Him as Lord and Savior, as He has drawn us into His kingdom and we have surrendered to Him because of the work of the Holy Spirit has already been doing in our lives. Yes, He changes what we do. Yes, He changes what we want to do. But we still struggle with sin. And if you're not struggling with sin, you're not aware of all of it in your life. 
And so one of the hardships that we face to enter the new kingdom is a battle that we individually have with the idols of our own hearts. And that is a battle that we need and must win. And we win it with the power of the Holy Spirit working in and through us. I just want to tell you, it's hard to say no to some sins. If you're honest with yourself, you may be sitting there thinking, oh, I live a pretty good life, get up in the morning, I don't really, I haven't shot anybody, I haven't robbed a bank, I haven't committed adultery. But if you had no gods before you but the Lord Jesus Christ, where is the passion of your heart in these days? Secondly, uh, we do face some kinds of persecution, uh, believe it or not. We are sometimes ridiculed, maybe not necessarily to our face, but we who hold the Scripture are often ridiculed for that. I think of those in college who are about to go to college. To stand up as a Christian... In a secular setting, always brings the potential for persecution, for ridicule, for os- being ostracized, for hostility, for being ignored. I told my seniors that the most important thing that they do when they go to college is not what they major in, it's not what sports they might want to play. It's not what fraternity or sorority they might want to join. The most important decision that a young person makes as they leave home and they go to college is what friends they pick there. Who they decide to associate with. Because that group will steer their hearts For the next several years. And I believe that with all my heart. And I believe it's true for adults as well. Not that we are to isolate ourselves from unbelievers. For they are the people who need the gospel. But we should find great joy in the fellowship with other Christians. But in your job, you might be passed over for a promotion because of your stance in Christianity. You might lose a client because you're not willing to bend the rules. You might not be be able to get a job as a contractor because you're not willing to pad your estimate. This should never be a surprise to us that we will face persecution and hardship in this world. Remember, even Jesus himself told us this. In John 16, he says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, he says, for I have overcome the world. You can be more than conquerors in this world through Jesus Christ. Paul would eventually write these words. What then shall I say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? What difference does that ridicule and persecution make in light of the fact that God is for you? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he, uh, how will he not also go along with him, graciously given, give us all things? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? Those whom God has chosen. It is God who justifies. 
Who is he that condemns? Jesus Christ, who died. More than that, who was raised to life and is at the right hand of God and is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? For it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep for slaughter. No, in all things we are more than conquerors through him who has loved us. Let me just close with this. If you are not experiencing some sort of persecution, some sort of hardship for the gospel, then you might, not necessarily, but you might want to ask, are you doing all that you're supposed to be doing for the kingdom? Because... God has promised us trouble in this world in our Christian walk. Now, that doesn't mean that we go look for trouble, but trouble will find you if you are spreading the good news of Jesus Christ. One last verse of hope, though. John writes in 1 John, You, dear children, are from God. And have overcome the world because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. I hope that persecution in terms of imprisonment never comes to us in Louisville. But we are a post Christian society. Just this week in England, a court ordered a mother and father to terminate the life of their child. It's coming, folks. It's coming. Let me close with a quote of A.W. Tozer. Christ calls men to carry a cross. We call them to have fun in His name. He calls them to forsake the world. We assure them that if they will accept Jesus, the world is their oyster. He calls them to suffer. We call them to enjoy all the bourgeoisie comforts of modern civilization. He calls them to be self-denying and calls them to death. We call them to spread themselves like green bay trees or perchance even to become stars in a pitiful fifth-rate zodiac. He calls them to holiness. We call them to a cheap and tawdry happiness that would have been rejected and scorned by the most stoic philosophers. We can afford to suffer now. We will have a long eternity to enjoy ourselves and our enjoyment will be valid and pure for it will come in the right way and at the right time. In this world you will have trouble. With great hardship you will enter the kingdom of heaven. But take hope for I have overcome the world. Let's pray.